creating realistic and natural drop shadows. There are two main kinds of shadows um, when we're working with creating drop shadows. There's what's called the anchor shadow, which goes directly beneath the object to make it look like it's attached to gravity and not floating in space. And then there's what's called the cast shadow, which gives the shadow direction. S most studio photographers, when they're selling products, uh, have to put it against a white background. Um, if you go online, especially um, kitchen stores like williamsonoma.com, sirletob.com, you can see that they have, underneath all their appliances, really nice looking drop shadows. Let's just take a look. And some of these drop shadows are created in post-production and some of them are created in the studio and then integrated or saved in post-production because they look so nice and natural that it can be difficult to create a perfect drop shadow. So if we go into like knife sets, for example, let's see if um, any of these products have drop shadows underneath them and we click on this set of knives here. Let's get a nice big one. You can see that this shadow off to the right hand side, that's not probably a natural drop shadow. That's a shadow that's been added in post-production. I don't think it's a particularly realistic looking one. Um, but all of those had to be manually added. Here's a good one this particular pot here. At first, when we look at it, we don't even really notice the drop shadow, but you see underneath there, that's an anchor shadow. So the bottom of the shadow right underneath the pot is really, really dark, and then it softens as it spreads out. Um, and that shadow is too perfect to have been made in the studio. That shadow is definitely added in post-production. All right. So um, taking a look at shadows in real life around the objects in your home, how do they behave when the quality of light and the direction of the light is a particular direction, logging into stock photography websites and calling up objects or scenes that you're trying to mimic in your collage, uh, studying the shadows and how realistic they're behaving can help inform how you need to recreate it that makes sense. But this is a really typical place to find um, manually created drop shadows. So to begin with, it's a, the scene is a little silly, but I chose it because the path is already drawn for the baseball. So we're going to add the baseball in this night scene. And we're going to add a, um, a gravity shadow, a cast shadow, we're going to burn and dodge, and then we will add a little bit of color to match the nighttime space. And notice how huge the baseball looks. So um, we don't really care about scale at this point. We're just going to take a look at the shadow. And these are the step-by-step -step instructions on the server. So I'm going to go ahead and open up these two files, RL and baseball, Photoshop 6. And we'll take a look at the baseball image first. You can add the shadows while the image is still in its own canvas, or you can do it um, when it's added to uh, the collage. Um, today, we're going to go ahead and take a look at it against a white background so that we can see what's happening. So the first thing um, we're going to do is probably enlarge the canvas size. This is not a very big canvas um, in order to make a cast shadow. So I have the layer against a separate white background layer so that when I enlarge the canvas size, um, it remi remains white. And mostly it's the width that I'm interested in. I'm going to go ahead and anchor the image on the bottom left-hand side and say OK. And you can see that I have a much wider canvas. I've already cut out the baseball. If we go to the paths, layer here, you can see that a path has been created already um, for the baseball. Here's the outline. If I click on it here, crawling ants have been made and we've already made a mask for the background. 
So that would be something that you'd need to do. You'd need to carefully draw a path around your object, select it, and then put it against a mask. Here, I'll go ahead and add the mask here. So it should look like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is target the image by command clicking on it or command clicking on the mask to load as a, to load it as a selection. And then I'm going to activate the background layer and make a new blank layer. And I'm going to call this uh, anchor shadow. And then I'm just going to fill this with black. Edit fill with black and say OK. And command D to deselect. Now you can kind of see the outline here, but I'm going to hold down my command key to get the move tool and tap a couple times on my uh, down arrow, one, two, three, four times, maybe even three, just to get this little bit of anchor shadow. Then I'm going to hit the marquee tool and draw a selection here because I don't need all of it. I really just need what's below the selection. So I can go ahead and mask out. I'm going to option click to mask the inverse, mask out what I don't need. And if I zoom in, you can see it's very, very subtle. Then I'm actually going to blur the paint, filter, blur, Gaussian blur, add a slight blur, not very big, because this is an anchor shadow, 0.5 to 1.0 approximately, and say OK. And I might choose to clean this image up a little bit but with my mask layer. By painting with black, I just need to make sure that my opacity is up here. And a nice big soft brush. You see how it's adding the soft edge? And my goal is just to make that little bit of gravity. So it looks like it has a little bit of gravity underneath. I'm going to reduce the opacity of the layer as much as I need to. And I may use the um, move tool in the arrow key to move it up and down if I need to. The next part is to add the cast shadow. So we're going to repeat the steps. I'm going to go ahead and command click on the uh, image or on the mask. I'm going to make a new layer. This one's going to be called cast, layer, cast shadow layer. Fill it with black and deselect. Now this is a little different because I'm actually going to transform this. So you may want to um, create a smart object before you do the transformation. Then I'm going to do a free transform or command T. And then I'm going to hold down, see what happens when we hold down the command key? We get the white arrow and I'm just going to use these top nodes here and place them on their side like that. And you can make a short shadow or a long shadow, depending on the time of day that you're trying to mimic. And I'm going to hit return. Next thing I'm going to do is add a mask to the, the cast shadow layer so that I can clean it up. Obviously, this doesn't look very natural here. So we're going to take some of it away, right? I just care about this part. Um, what else do I, might I want to do that I did to the last one? It's a smart object, so I can add a smart filter. If you want to make this a smart object as well, you can also take advantage of the smart filters. So I'm going to add a little bit of a blur, maybe a little bit more than the last one, say OK. And this is looking pretty good, but it doesn't look quite realistic. Um, one more thing that I might like to do is add a gradient to this mask in order to, um, and let's see if I get the tools out here. I may add the gradient tool in order to kind of feather or gradient this mask a little bit. So I'll click on the gradient tool, make sure my mask is activated. And I actually want to go the other way around. I want the darkest part inside and the lightest part on the outside. I have to go back with my brush again and get rid of this little guy. And then I may want to lower my opacity. If you're working against a colorful background, you can convert your blending mode into an overlay or a multiply layer. As you can see, it doesn't really work well on a white background. But if you're working on a textured background or a colored background, it works pretty well. 
So finally, I'm ready to move this into the other image. But before I do that, I want to group these layers. I'm going to click on the top one, shift click on the bottom one, and choose a new group from layers and call this baseball and say OK. And now I should be able to take this whole group here with my move tool. I have the whole group selected. Click and hold, drag it up into this layer here, or this new canvas here, drag it down and release my mouse, say OK, and I brought in the whole group. How's that for size? Good? Kind of as large as the Ferris wheel, so I'm going to Command T. It says, oh, let's see, um, so I'm transforming the whole group. You can rotate it a little bit if you want. Okay, and say OK. And obviously the scale is not accurate. Um, and we want to do some fine tuning. One of the things that we, we might want to do is a dodge and burn layer. So um, I'm going to go ahead and make a blank layer at the top and call it dodge and burn. Let's see, I need to move it up here. Dodge burn. And what dodging and burning does is it helps you sculpt the image into the background a little bit. I could also add a curve on this whole thing to just darken some of the um, midtones. I could select it here first and add a little bit of a mask here. And that actually helps a lot, make it a little more realistic. So I've toned it down. Um, I can also go into my blue layer and reduce a little bit of blue and therefore warm it up a little bit. Okay, and I could still, I'm going to move my dodge and burn up at the top here. In the overlay mode, I could still do some burning and dodging. Remember, I need my um, black paintbrush to burn. I'm going to turn down the opacity here, make sure I'm in overlay mode and just go in and kind of burn down the baseball a little bit here, a little bit on the top. And at this point, if you needed to, go in and take a look at these um, cast layer and anchor layer. Did I lose my, nope, there it is. Um, I might need to turn this up a little bit to get it to show through to whatever background I'm putting this image against. Um, and I might need to tweak it, move it around a little bit. I may want to move the anchor layer down a little bit more and then bring the opacity down a little bit. So th that's the basic way to add a drop shadow. Um, again, once you have the images combined, in order to make to match up the resolutions, at the very end you can add a grain layer. I want to add it on top of the group by filling it with 50% gray, putting it in an overlay or soft light mode, and adding a filter. You can turn this into a smart object if you want to make it editable by using a smart filter and putting a little noise on the top. And what this does is it blends images with different resolutions and ISOs into um, a common looking surface texture, furthering the truth or fiction effect that we're going for. Let's give this a shot.